We spent a chapter talking about gases. Now we just looked at both solids and liquids. So now we're going to look at mixing them together. We're going to talk about solutions. Now solutions are simply homogeneous mixtures. This is a topic we discussed at the beginning of the year. And when we're talking about homogeneous mixtures, we're going to have a solute and a solvent. The solute and the solvent combine together to make a solution. If we have a solution of, say, salt water, salt will be the solute and water will be the solvent. The solute dissolves into the solvent. Now when we think of solutions, we often think of aqueous solutions. We think of things dissolved in water. And those are a type of solution that we very commonly use in this course. But solutions can be made of any combination of states of matter. Steel is a solution. It's a homogeneous mixture of two solids. The carbonation in a beverage is a solution. It's a mixture of a gas, carbon dioxide, and water. When talking about the dissolving process, we can consider some of the intermolecular attractions that we discussed in the last homework. When dissolving salt in water, for example, we can talk about how the polar water molecules actually attract both the sodium cations and the chloride anions. This is called the solvation process, or the process of making a solution. You have to consider how the negative side of a water molecule will be attracted to the positive sodium ion, and the positive side of the water molecule will be attracted to the negative chloride ions. We also have to consider how the water molecules attract each other and the ions attract each other. So for the dissolving process to happen, the water molecules have to stop sticking to each other, the ions have to stop sticking to each other, and the water molecules have to start sticking to the ions. So there's actually a lot going on here. In practice, if we were to take an ionic compound like salt and dissolve it in water, what you would see is that each ion would get surrounded by a group, usually six, water molecules. And again, you can see how the positive sides of the water molecules are attracted to the negative ion, the chloride anion, and how the negative sides of the water molecules are attracted to the positive sodium cation. Once the water molecules surround the ions, then they can just float freely in solution. So let's make sure we're okay with a little bit of vocabulary before we go forward. We learned solubility rules earlier in the year when we talked about double replacement reactions. We talked about things being soluble in water or insoluble in water. In reality, it's not that clear cut. There are degrees of solubility. Some things dissolve very readily in a solvent and some things don't dissolve at all in a solvent. And so we can talk about things being soluble, insoluble, or even slightly soluble. Generally speaking, the warmer the solvent, the more solid you can dissolve in it. If you've ever made rock candy, you're aware of this. Because to make rock candy, you make something called a simple syrup. You warm up water, you actually get it up to like a boiling point, and then you can add a tremendous amount of sugar to the water, much more than you would expect. As the water cools down, however, that sugar can no longer stay dissolved. And so it recrystallizes, it precipitates out. And if you hang a string or a stick in that simple syrup, you'll get the crystal sugar precipitate out onto that surface. The text has this chart showing solubility curves of different substances. Let's take a look here. On the x-axis, you have the temperature measured in degrees Celsius, going from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. And on the y-axis, you have the solubility of each of these solids. And it's how many grams of solute you can put in 100 grams of water. And so this black line right here, this is sodium chloride, that's table salt. And you can see, as you warm up the water, you can just ever so slightly get more and more salt dissolved in the water. But other compounds, you can see a much more dramatic change. As you warm the water, you get much more of that solid dissolved. In fact, it doesn't take much to see that for some of these solids, you can actually get more than 100 grams of the solid dissolved in 100 grams of water at pretty reasonable temperatures. So let's go back to the vocab. We discussed the word solubility. Let's talk about the word dilute. Dilute can be a verb or an adjective. If you are going to dilute something, it means that you're going to add solvent to it. So if you have a solution that is too concentrated, 
you can add water to it to dilute it. Or you can use the word dilute as an adjective. You can talk about a solution being very dilute, meaning there isn't very much solute in the solvent. It has a low concentration. A solution that is dilute can also be described as unsaturated. An unsaturated solution is a solution where there's room to dissolve more solute within the solvent. The opposite of unsaturated is saturated. Saturated means that you've dissolved the maximum amount of solute in the solvent. And you've experienced a saturated solution if you're a coffee drinker or if any of your friends are coffee drinkers. Because you'll see people who drink coffee put a tremendous amount of sugar in the coffee before drinking it. When they're done drinking it, you'll see that there's a pile of undissolved sugar at the bottom of the cup. There's undissolved sugar in the bottom of the cup because they saturated that coffee solution with sugar and the extra sugar that they put in couldn't dissolve and just settled in at the bottom of the cup. So when you look at these solubility curves, these solubility curves show you the saturation points. They show you at what amount of solute you can put in the solvent where you get to saturation. If you're below these curves, then you are unsaturated. It is also possible to go above the curves and supersaturate a solution. Supersaturation is basically tricking the solvent to hold more solute than you would expect. And how you would do this is you would warm up the solvent and then cool it very gently. Like in the rock candy, we would expect that as it cooled, some of that solute would precipitate out and go back into a solid. But if you have the conditions just right, you can keep that solute still up in solution. It's not really stable, but it's a pretty neat phenomenon. So now that we have some vocab, let's take a look at a question and see if we can use these solubility curves. At 30 degrees Celsius, I've got 60 grams of sodium chloride, and I have it dissolved in 200 grams of water. Would we describe the solution as being unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated? Now to answer this question, we're going to need the solubility curve. So we're looking at the sodium chloride line right here. And we're looking at 30 degrees Celsius. So here's 30 degrees Celsius. So if I follow this line up here, 30 degrees Celsius is right about here. All right, so now where does that correspond in the y-axis? Well, that's gonna be somewhere about here. So if I look at that, that's telling me somewhere around, well, let's just say halfway between 30 and 40. So that's telling me I'm getting 35 grams of NaCl. But that's 35 grams of NaCl that's being dissolved in 100 grams of water, right? That's what our y-axis says. So I have 35 grams of NaCl in 100 grams of water. The question is about 200 grams of water. So if I can put 35 grams of NaCl in 100 grams of water, I should be able to put 70 grams of NaCl in 200 grams of water. The question, however, says that I've got 60 grams of sodium chloride. So according to the chart, I can put 70 grams of sodium chloride in 200 grams of water. If I have 60 grams of sodium chloride, well then I have more room for more solute. I'm not at the saturation point yet. So the answer to this question is, if you have 60 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 200 grams of water at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, then your solution will be unsaturated. You are below the saturation curve here.